Hi everyone, this is Cryo, and recently I finished my very first BL4 run in Bloodborne. Hey Cryo, aren't you gonna play the new Demon's Souls remake on PlayStation 5? Now if you're unfamiliar with what that is, a BL4 run means choosing the lowest level class, the Waste of Skin class, which starts at level 4, and finishing the entire game, all bosses and DLC bosses, without leveling up. This is obviously a very restricting condition as you'll stay with minimal health and damage while the enemies and hazards quickly escalate far beyond your limits. And that's not mentioning the old Hunter's DLC that couples high health and damage with some extremely aggressive enemies. However, having finished my run just a few days ago, I can confidently say that in Bloodborne, more than in any other game in the Soulsborne series, a base level run is not only highly rewarding but also extremely useful, and I have four reasons as to why that's the case. One, it's a very refreshing challenge. Uh, speaking as someone that does lower level runs of these games practically all the time to create new characters and builds for PvP, I pretty much always have a plan of action that I can resort to make it easier for me to clear the game, be that immense damage or unique spells and tools. But that's not the case with the BL4 run, because at such a low level, you have nothing other than the weapon you chose. You won't be able to meet the requirements of a ton of useful gear that would make your life easier, so suddenly you start to care a lot more about where you find the next Bloodstone Shard or bow Paper or Molotov Cocktail or even throwing knives. Because your strategies are so limited, every little addition to your arsenal becomes that much more impactful, and you start resorting to tactics you'd never even consider when your health and damage can cover your mistakes. Two, you end up recognizing every boss's patterns. This is something I only ever did when I ran into very tanky or damaging bosses while playing normally, but when even the weakest bosses and enemies are elevated to one-shot potential, you'll find yourself desperately studying every way their AI reacts to your inputs. Because now you cannot rely on recovering from mistakes as often, since every mistake can be your last, analyzing the telegraphs and positioning of your enemies becomes an invaluable tool to survive. 3. It improves your unlocked play. This is a skill set I only use to employ in Chalice dungeons, obviously because your health is cut in half in the most valuable dungeons, so making sure your weapon lands the attack in every opportunity is very important to compensate for some wonky hitboxes and animations. Some enemies and bosses move around way too much or are very far above the ground for you to just lock onto them and swing away. So unlocking and aiming your swings manually puts you in greater control of the situation and allows you to take those windows of opportunity more efficiently. Most of the time in Bloodborne, and in all these games for that matter, if an enemy moves around too fast, the camera either jerks around so abruptly you'll be left disoriented, or it just unlocks altogether and the enemy disappears behind your back, which may or may not result in hits taken. Unlocked play kind of fixes that issue, since you'll be able to move the camera around in the direction you think the threat's coming from. Again, since you're always so close to death, this becomes invaluable. In 4, and arguably the most important point, it gives you an interchangeable character. So most of the time I create characters for PvP, and so I limit myself in blood level to reach a specific pool of players and areas, right? But now that I finished my blood level 4 run, I have a BL4 character that I can save my PS4 storage, level up to whatever build I want, and then reload the old save to try something else if I feel like it. And this is only really possible in Bloodborne, because there's no weapon level matchmaking here. So that plus 10 weapon that you use to finish the game won't affect your matchmaking in any way, shape or form. In Dark Souls Remastered, DS2 and DS3, I'd have to limit myself so much that I don't think I'd be able to do a base level run of those games in such a short time frame. At least not to reach all levels, but upgrade great levels and builds in the same way I think. <laughs> this is really the main reason why I think everyone should do a BL4 run, because you'll have a character that you can do whatever you want with and cover as many builds as possible. And the tools the game allows you here are reasonable enough that I think anyone can make it work. I mean, if me, who's a huge trash in these games, can do it, I'm sure anyone else can. So that's it for the main topic, I'm gonna move on to my impressions and notes on the run now. First boss I fought was a cleric beast, and to be honest, I sometimes think this boss is a bit too tanky for the early game. I don't think even Udex Gundir takes as many hits to die as a cleric beast, which really only compounds the fact that this boss can combo and chase you out of nowhere for some damage numbers that can easily escalate to death. That said, if you fight it enough, it's a fairly predictable boss, and if you bring either the Saw Spear or the Sword Cleaver, dishing out damage is much easier. On a side note, you can get a free visceral attack by shooting its face a few times. Though, if you're doing a blood level 4 run, I highly advise you to not take the visceral and just attack its sides. That way you do more damage. Overall, it's a simple but really drawn out fight. Next up was Father Gascoigne, and I gotta say, his gunshots are such an annoyance. 
furthermore, sometimes he gets hyper armor, even in jump attacks. Which, I know it's a mechanic, but I don't remember even German doing that. So seeing that as a second boss is quite a shock. His phase 2 with a halberd is also pretty damn annoying, as he gets very aggressive here and starts chasing you to dish out row catch after row catch, which is fairly easy for him to do when there's so many tombstones to get in your way in this arena. Now, the tombstones are both a problem and a blessing, because, like I said, they can get in the way of your dodging, but they can also be used to kite gas coin, which gets you a few healing windows. And finally, I didn't see much of phase 3, because I was aware of how aggressive it gets in the stage, so I had a plan already. Use the music box to get a single backstab, and follow up with a bomb. Luckily for me, that was enough to kill him, so I didn't see much of this phase. Overall, it's a tense fight to do the cramped arena and Gascoigne speed in phase 2 damage, but it's manageable. Up next we have the Bloodstorf Beast, which, yes, can be cheesed with punch and block cocktails and fire paper, but I'd rather keep these for phase 2 onwards, because I'm really used to fighting this guy at a phase 1. It should be noted that in the early game, most of this guy's attacks can either one-shot you or combo you to death, which is basically another one-shot. So the fight can be derailed very quickly if you don't know its stealth, but I do, so this was easy. It's a tense fight due to the constant one-shot threat, but it's manageable. Then there was Vicar Amelia, which kinda surprised me to be honest. At first I thought staying on the side was the right way to do this, but I found that strategy to be extremely dangerous because she can swipe at you on her sides very often. Believe it or not, her front is actually safer. As the hitboxes are shorter, you can read her better and the head takes more damage. Also to compound everything, if you stay on her sides, she starts jumping backwards to reposition and that jump has a hitbox, so that can stun you out of your attacks. The Saw Spear and the Saw Cleaver, again, are fantastic here, since both can attack frequently and have the serrated damage bonus, which means that if you can keep up the assault, she's never gonna use the healing magic. I'd say that the damage on Amelia is pretty high for the early game, but she's fairly slow and her range is short enough that you can compensate by just strafing around the arena. It's not that hard and it's actually an enjoyable bout. Now for the Witches of Hamwick. As I'm sure you all know, this fight can be made extremely easy by spending all the insight before the fight, but I didn't do that because I was in a hurry. So if you choose to fight the witches with insight, you need to be rotating the camera around constantly to watch out for the mad ones, because these guys can activate hyper armor even faster than Gascoigne and their damage and combos can get pretty freaking crazy. On the witches themselves, they have a few AoE attacks, but the biggest threat is the paralyzing beam, which if you get hit by, you're almost certainly dead from mad one spam and the witch come to grab you. And because there's two witches, this fight can be quite a hassle and your progress can be derailed extremely quickly, so it's a medium fight. Quite tense, actually. <laughs> Moving on to Henrik. This guy, like every other hunter, is tanky as all balls. And because Eileen comes in to help you, and I can't hear her too much, because I want to keep her questline going, I also can't R1 spam too much. So there goes our best strategy. In this situation, the best I could do is let her take some damage, and then I would come in to poke him with some transformed R1s if he were crowding, or spam the untransform mode if she was far. Still, he has a lot of health, and with my base level character, this took some time. Thankfully for me, he doesn't handle ganks very well, so he died before me and her. All I needed was to keep up the pressure. Now at this point, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm gonna start the Chalice Dungeons. But just so you guys know, I already fight pretty much most of the Chalice Dungeon bosses with next to no health because of the 50% health penalty, so I don't have much to say on these bosses. Like, at most, the Undead Giant is boring because of how much health he has. The Merciless Watchers I can handle as long as I don't make any mistakes. Getting shot even once is a death sentence. But I do have some stuff to say on the Watchdog of the Old Lords. First off, as you all know, this guy has armor and it can be broken. There are two armors that you can focus on, either the head or the legs. But the head is arguably the best place for you to punish him because breaking the armor on the legs makes him do an explosion wake up, which is very dangerous. If you break his head armor, his wake up is a short range lava spew which is fairly easy to avoid as long as you stay far away enough. But he starts phase 2, whichever one you choose to break first, and in this stage, pretty much all of his attacks are too dangerous to punish, except for the one when he bites forward. 
this one is very easy to avoid and very easy to punish and I try to focus mostly on that. Though I did fight him long enough to figure out a few other punishes. The worst part about this guy is that his hitboxes are an absolute mess. They alternate between the range of your nose and the range of Australia and coupling all of that with his abominable damage, fighting this guy at BL4 is pretty nerve wracking. This fire wave he has in particular is a huge pain in the ass. I died to this attack way too many times until I figured out that the blind spot is on the sides, not backwards. Not much more to add, very tough fight. With that out of the way, I moved on to the Shadows of Yarnum, which are three fast bosses at once against my BL4, so this is gonna be fun. Immediately, since Katana Weave here is such a trigger happy fella, I just drag him away from his gank and damage him exclusively. And that's because, while they might have separate health bars, the trigger for phase 2 is the overall health of the three. If you damage all of them too much, all of them will be stronger once you get to phase 2. It's better to focus fire on one of them to avoid being overwhelmed by them all. They're also susceptible to parrying, so you can use that to improve your damage efficiency, but these guys attack so frequently that it becomes safer to just take the repost so you can be interrupted and killed. Avoiding committing too much to just one shadow helps you avoid the others. Attack and burst, retreat, this is just a battle of attrition. Once Katana guy is dead, focus on the Katana Pyromancer. He's too stupid to escape a few R1s, and you just need to make sure the caster doesn't corner and spam you. And once that guy is dead, the only thing we need to make sure of is that the caster doesn't summon snakes, because that can combo you to death. Otherwise, he's as much of an idiot as the other one. But until you get to this point, this fight is quite hard. You're under constant threat of being assaulted from all sides, and there's not much room to escape without rolling. Camera control here is a must. Before we get to Rome, I wanted to fight Yuri, and we all know that this chick is an absolute unit. She takes a ton of damage, and whether her arcane tools damage you or one-shot you is completely random. Or at least it feels completely random. In addition to that, her Rose Marinus is actually a dangerous DLT threat now, since you're at BL4. <laughs> With that said, she doesn't have many options against Sauce PR1 spam. And if you land the Transform Charge R2, she doesn't know how to avoid the follow-up attack, so you can use Hyper Armor to sneak in some free hits if you think she won't use a spell. So, as long as you don't get cornered by her projectiles, there's not much you can do against your stock of 20 blood vials. After Yuri, I fought... Dark Beast Power, because Rom was too hard, so I needed some more damage. So, Power. The math here is simple. Can you stagger him for a few hits? Then you have a good chance. You can stagger him, then prepare for one of the most hectic fights in the game. Fortunately for me, even at PL4, I can stagger him reliably thanks to a decent upgrade level and serrated damage bonus along with high attack frequency. Once he staggers for the first time, he's gonna take several pauses in action to rebuff, and you can abuse these to damage him left and right. But while he's in full cocaine mode, his attacks have high damage and massive range. So yes, he can combo you from all the way across the screen. Be warned that you can roll through the lightning explosions, but the timing is very tight, and the punishment for missing is catastrophic. So I either eat the damage standing still or strafe away. By the way, I do not recommend locking onto Parl, because he's very skinny and you can miss very easily. And finally, Herring Set helps a bunch here with the extra lightning defense. Very frantic fight and things can escalate quickly, so you should stay on your toes. And with Parl dead, now I can buy bolt paper and now I can finally fight Rom. So in case you didn't know, there's this little trick to speedrun Rom. Kill the spiders, use a beast block pellet, hit her head with your bare fists transforming attacks until the beast wood bar fills, switch to a weapon, buff it, and start wailing on her body. This dishes out a ton of damage, even at BL4. With some scaling and a weapon that's a little bit stronger, you can kill Rom in the first phase. But of course that's not my case, so I can't finish her in the first phase. So I still need to go through phase 2, which is, appropriately, a nightmare. The spiders will be constantly drawing your attention, getting in the way and trying to combo you from behind the camera, all while Rom is pelting with one-shot attacks. I was getting wrecked all the time with barely a few hits for Rom to die. So for this one, I took some time to farm some materials and gems, and returned later with some more damage, which made all the difference. Needless to say, this was my first difficulty wall of a BO4 run. Next I fought the Keeper of the Old Lords, also known as the holder of my favorite armor set. Christ's sake dude, this guy is bad news. He can dish out high damage almost instantly, into one shot potential. In addition, he can chase you around like few other enemies can. Fighting this guy is a trial in patience and luck. In fact, he's so dangerous in phase 2 that I had to resort to cheesing him with poison knives and projectiles. Because I couldn't risk getting one shot at, not after such a long struggle. Even parrying him is a massive risk, since almost all of his attacks launch fire waves that stun you forever. It's a very hard fight. I do not know how to fight this guy legit at BL4. And once I had the bone rush set, it was time for Mario Logarius, which is basically the hardest boss in the base game. Everyone else is but an insect compared to him. 
and that's for a few reasons. In phase 1, he can dish out one shot levels of damage with hyper armor almost instantly. Countering this one arcane explosion meant attacking him twice and fleeing, just in case he would use it. By the way, did I mention he has lots of health? Because he does. And then in phase 2, he goes completely insane and chases after you to combo you to death. Damn near everything he does carries the risk of getting slashed into oblivion. The safest option I found was to dodge to his sides to abuse his less than perfect tracking to heal once. Defeating Logaria is meant being cautiously aggressive in phase 1 and then switching to full on guerrilla mode in phase 2. Not gonna lie, developing this transition was very fun, I'll give him that. Also, I found that staying just far enough away from him before he did a floating swipe, not the floating smash, and dodging forward would put him in perfect backstab position. You can also backstab his explosion windup as long as his back isn't against a wall. But by far, the worst part of this fight is the run up to the arena. It's such a long stroll just to try this difficult duel again. As for the fight itself, it was hard as hell, but it was fun as hell too. And now we get to the one reborn, and first things first, kill the witches, as their damage is now very significant and can very well combo you to death. Though, as you're doing that, you should know that while not every hit from the boss can kill you outright, even in BO4, he can still clip several of his attacks into walls, while you have no idea where he is, and they do enough damage that you're better off topping yourself at all times to avoid a two-shot. When you're fighting him directly, the Reborn has these little legs sprouting from all over his body, and their kicks have enough damage and hit stun now that they can ruin your perfect attempt at this boss. By the way, there is a trick to speed running this guy. By carving through his base enough times, he will stagger and his upper half will fall to the floor, giving you a very long window for safe punishing. If you dish enough damage to his smaller torso here, you can trigger another stagger right after the first one, which will likely be enough to finish him in the first few seconds of the fight. But I forgot to bring my beast blood pellets, so I can't dish out enough damage for that, which means I had to take on this thing's aggression head on. And quite frankly, I hate this boss. Although Watchdog has a few large hitboxes, this guy has dozens of larger hitboxes and his range is absurd. And on top of that, he's constantly casting magic. I literally can't read half of his spells due to how big and misshaped he is. My best guess is to assume his AI will trigger a long range attack if I'm away, and then I use that animation to get close to him while he misses a shot. But the worst part about this fight is undoubtedly the run back. This one minute jog in an area that's crowded with strong enemies is the most annoying thing I have to deal with in this run. Luckily for me, on my last attempt, I managed to stagger him a second time out of sheer fighting, though I have no idea how that was possible. All I know is that I took a chance, which comboed him into yet another stagger, which was enough to finish him off. As far as I know, this boss is completely unpredictable, and beating him is a 50-50 mix of skill and luck. He might be hard, but being hard implies that there is a way to avoid difficulty, which I still haven't found yet. So until then, I'll just call him unfair. Amygdala's up next, and sadly for Amy here, I fought her several times in the Chalice Dungeons, so I'm more or less used to avoiding her attacks kinda reliably. I mostly choose to fight right in front of her so that I can know what she's doing. She has some wonky hitboxes a la one reborn, but nothing that egregious. Even her longest range attacks are easily punishable if you approach her carefully. There's this trick to cheesing her by standing behind her to bait the slam, which misses most of the time and allows for a massive punch on the head, but in my experience, that fails about 10% of the time. And if that happens, my base health guy here just dies, so that's not a worthy risk. By the way, a fully upgraded gun works wonders here. It gives me the option to dish out damage to the head while she's performing an unpunishable attack, like the fire vomit. Honestly, the only thing that's likely to cure here is greed. This boss is fairly manageable despite how big and intimidating it looks, and the run back is very short, so meh. Not that much of a challenge. Our next stop is the Nightmare of Mansus and Mikolash. So the hard aspect of Mikolash's fight is threefold. He's tough to funnel into the signature dead end, his puppets can combo you out of nowhere, and his call beyond can ruin several minutes of hard work. Being patient while scaring him and focusing on finishing his puppets while keeping him in camera tends to do the trick for me. The biggest obstacle here is the call beyond, but if you look for the moment he raises his arms, you can dodge the attack very reliably. Really, this fight isn't hard, it's just monotonous, which can make you lose focus and make a single mistake that costs you the attempt. But since that's my entire run right now, not much has changed. And actually, something really weird happened in my run here. I landed a few attacks on Mikolash while he was in the hallways, and that somehow made him engage me right then and there. He never went running into the second dead end like he usually does. I have no idea how that was possible, nor was I gonna stay to find out, so I just killed him here anyway. Following that, I went to kill the Crow of Kainhurst, and I was kinda surprised, he couldn't one-shot me no matter how hard he tried. 
but he's still ridiculously tanky and hits like a truck. So no, I ain't fighting this bitch legit, no sir. And because there's no fog wall and you have the entire area to work with, you can get away with poisoning him with poison knives, which will add on top of the Chikage health drain when he transforms it. His infamous repeating pistol shots can one-shot you and as long as you pay attention you'll notice that he always rolls before firing it, giving you a generous tell to avoid the next shot and heal. Maintaining calm near death is tough but easy to learn. Something else that works here is that this dumbass is extremely predictable with Ejikage. Once he decides he wants to attack with neutral R1s, you can pretty much guarantee a parry when he's near you. He also can't recognize full charge R2s, so the Saw Spear is a perfect choice yet again. I died to him only twice really, and I even got a stylish finish here, check it out. I don't have much to say on this Celestial Mystery, even a BF4 this boss is a joke to deal with. The big guy can combo you to death, but as long as you're careful he can for the life of him chasing you around, so no matter what you do he'll likely die before producing any challenge worth mentioning. So let's move on to Abritas. Yet another boss, I fight in the Chalice Dungeons all the time, except this time I can survive her charge, which is a lot better than getting one-shotted. As I'm not about that charge, it's the only attack you need to keep an eye out for all the time. You need to keep baiting out the attacks that you can punish and stay on the run just in case she uses the charge. If you see her revving up, run back and then sideways if you have enough distance already. But if she uses it right in your face, do not run, because running makes you take extra damage. It's better to just eat the damage while calmly strafing. And that strategy works here because a bitch just takes ridiculous damage on the head, regardless of whether you use ball paper, thrust attack or both. <laughs> but naturally combining everything melts her away lightning fast. Given these massive weaknesses here in the base game, Ebrita simply can kill you if you know what you're doing, unless she corners you. Keeping a high damage efficiency here is very easy, so it's an easy boss really. I actually kinda like fighting her. Before I proceed, watch me secure a poor old Jura here. Nearing the end, we reach the Wet Nurse, which actually poses a serious threat right now, believe it or not. Mainly because her attacks cover a wide area in several hitboxes and she's incredibly tanky to compensate for being so slow. Which means the fight lasts for a long time during which you can't rely on your health bar to compensate for your mistakes. This move, where she summons a copy of herself, is also nerve-wracking, since getting spit roasted by two nurses with this little health basically means certain death. But just like with the Clark Beast, as long as you keep calm and don't give it to greed, she can do much but slowly perish. I would say I like the fight for being so dangerous over time, but this is a very monotonous affair, so at least it's somewhat challenging. Now, I wanted to finish the DLC before facing the game's final bosses, so up next I tried the Gatlinger Hunter, who can put up quite the fight, I'll give him that. Just like with the Crow Kinghurst, he dishes out high damage with both a machine gun and a soul spear of his own, except he is inside a dark cave. But I already had a strategy here. Let Elixir completely nullifies the use of his Soul Spear, and he can be easily interrupted in all of his attacks with some good old R1 spin. This idiot never dodges and just eats the damage like it's his lunch. Trivial affair. And now we finally get to Bloodborne's second hardest boss, which took me just under half an hour to beat. Look, the thing about Ludwig is that he's kinda like Pontiff Sullivan in Dark Souls 3. His attacks are timed specifically to roll catch you and track your movement, so once you stop spamming dash and start finding his blind spots, the fight becomes infinitely easier. His damage in phase 1 is high but manageable, and in phase 2 he gets 2 short combo potential, but he recovers so slowly from every attack chain that I can easily punish him left and right. Avoiding transforming attacks here is very useful since his openings allow for several hits in a row too, and because he staggers after a given amount of hits dealt in phase 2, you're likely to get an even bigger winner to punish him like a maniac. So yeah, this boss really wasn't that hard. However, the fight is incredibly fun when you can die in a few hits. I got to enjoy dodging his moves at a lot more now. Before I get into the next boss, I just want to give a shout out to this bitch ass gun spamming asshole hunter in the research hall. This bastard loves projectiles, and this tiny hallway filled with obstacles is just perfect for him to pelt you with them. I died to this guy almost as much as I died to Ludwig. Eventually I got fed up with this crap and so I said, you want a gunfight? You got a gunfight now. Thank god I upgraded my pistol and got a nice blood tin gem for it, because these bone marrow ass shots here were just enough to cancel this jerk. 
With this dumbass 6 feet under, I can now move on to the living failures. Which taught me an important lesson, exploiting weaknesses isn't always preferable. In this case, I had an upgrade of Fairy Cane to poke these aliens, but its attacks were too slow to make a difference. And once again, even without thrust damage bonus, the soft spear attacks so quickly that it more compensates for it. As for fight itself, you can melt these weirdos with bow paper, beast block pellet and some decent positioning. Transforming attacks are amazing here to build up beast hood while carving at their health. The biggest problem is that these guys have Dark Souls 1 poise, so whenever they decide to attack, you have to recognize that tell ASAP because there's no stopping them. Baron can make a big difference to improve your damage efficiency here, but just like with the Shadows of Yarnum, there's so many failures in such a small arena that punishing a parry properly is stupidly dangerous. Hit and run strategy works best here, and I highly advise you to keep the camera moving at all times. These guys can easily sneak up on your back for high damage or a straight up one shot. It's a boring fight really, kinda like the Wagners. And now for some my abuse. Here's the thing, Maria's phase 1 can be trivialized by gunshots and simple dodging and punishing, it's not anything to cry home about. In phase 2 she gets a bigger range for the blood attacks and I think she gets more poise, but really, nothing you can't still dodge and punish. Phase 3 is where things can go south in the blink of an eye. Now her attacks not only have larger hitboxes, but also lingering hitboxes, thanks to the fire effects, which can easily stun you from full health to dead. I read online that the fire can actually stun and damage you even if you land a successful parry, all due to the hitboxes that stay active way longer than what the game shows. I'm gonna be honest, I tried for a long time to get a BL4 no hit Maria kill, until I realized how inconsistent and poorly designed phase 3 is. And I simply said, screw it, if the game is not gonna behave according to its own rules, I don't have any obligation to treat this fight with care, you girl have a knife with your name on it. Look, you can like Maria's boss fight all you want and I don't judge you, but I don't consider a dissonance between game mechanics and visual reference an indication of careful design. What does From expect me to do here? Isekai myself into Bloodborne's code to know when the damn fire actually hits? As a result of this loppiness, phases 1 and 2 are ridiculously easy and phase 3 essentially resorts to cheating to create a challenge. Disagree with me if you want, I'm not stopping you. But this is one fight I believe is better experience when you have the health to tank a few hits. Doing this with no health just exacerbates the broken mechanics, which is kind of the charm of a base level run, really. Anyway, eventually I managed to last long enough to kill her. And since the Orphan of Cause is considered the hardest boss in the game, I thought, you know, I'm gonna try Lawrence first, maybe he's easier. Oh boy, was I in for a treat. Lawrence was the hardest boss in this entire run for me. Even the orphan wasn't anywhere near the suffering I endured with this roasted goat. The challenge with Lawrence comes from three factors. A long schlong of a health bar, in-game damage, and AoE explosions to everything he does. Beating him at BL4 is the closest the base game gets to the FRC dungeons, because it's a matter of not letting him touch you even once. And it's not that like he can kill you in one shot, but he does have a fast follow-up attack to almost every window you think he can punish, so getting hit even once probably means getting hit again, which is gonna be your downfall. And the problem is that you need to get close to those large sweeps and explosions, so you can have a chance at hitting him. So I had to spend over an hour just learning all of his attacks to be able to tell which openings are safe. And then another hour and a half to execute these predictions as perfectly as I can manage. And all of that doesn't take phase 2 into account, when he loses the lower half of his body and uses a completely new moveset that you have to learn. Thankfully for me, I eventually found several openings for safe punishes, even through the fire and flames. I'd say his grabs are some of the best moves throughout space. He can still be staggered with gunshots to the face. Locking on doesn't help at all, so fighting him unlocked. And finally, never let him corner you. You need room to escape his massive swipes in case you make a mistake, so always have the room's dimensions in mind. Phase 2 then happens, and this is both easier and harder to handle. There's only one attack you need to watch out for, and that's the crawling smashes. He's gonna slap the ground a total of 7 times while moving at you very fast, and all these slaps explode on impact. There's no way to punish that and you can be comboed to death easily, so you just gotta avoid it and wait for another attack you can't punish. And to avoid it, you need the room to run away, so always keep some distance between your back and the wall. Every other attack is fairly short range and has a slow recovery, so you can reasonably get one hit in after them to get a feel for his timing. This one tiny swipe with the right hand takes such a long time to end that you can actually hit him three times with a fast enough weapon. I'd say aside from the crawling attack, his regular crawling animation can also be mistaken for an attack, so watch out for that. And 
that's about it. Despite how long it took me to kill Lawrence, I actually enjoyed this fight a ton. Mostly because he's not too big that I can't tell what he's doing at any given time. I have a great deal of respect for this fight now, certainly a lot more than for Maria's fight. And now, for the actual second hardest boss in the game, in my opinion. Now, as some of you know, I have a ton of experience fighting the Orphan at low level, so I already had his thousand times memorized. But in case some of you want to hear some tips, here goes. In phase 1, the Orphan has several easily parable attacks, allowing you to punish him very consistently. This jump he does all the time can be simply strafed and then backstabbed almost inevitably. And this lower shit slam down is practically a parrying invitation. Dancing in and out of his attack range is also very useful for baiting attacks you want him to use. His tracking is actually weird to get a feel, some attacks will miss you completely while others have a magnetic pull, but really is nothing you can learn with some practice. And then phase 2 is obviously the infamous damage machine gun. However, he has a very specific weakness now, and that's gunshots in general. Most of his attacks can be parried, but even if they have a scary and deceptive timing, they can still be simply interrupted by gunshots to the face. You see what I mean, the attack doesn't need to parry him, it just straight up stops him in his tracks. I actually don't know why he gets staggered so easily, but I suspect it's because he lowers his posture enough that the shot lands on his head, which counts for extra stagger and damage or something? Also, he has absolutely no option for long range engagement. No laser, giant launch. If you run away from him, he has no choice other than running at you to begin attacking again. He can run pretty fast, but again, he only has medium to short range attacks, so if you know where the attack is gonna land, just dodge once or twice, get some distance, and heal or set up the next turn of action. You can't go too far into the ocean though, since there's an invisible wall that, that he'll pin you against if you let him. Of course, through both phases he has a tendency to essentially R1 spam you to run you down as fast as possible. And this has an element of intimidation that you have to deal with, because it means he can roll catch you fairly consistently. It's not easy to stay calm while under his assault, so you should look out for that. Ultimately, I love this fight, almost as much as Lawrence. It's hectic and fair once you know how to counter him. And with the DLC finished, it's time to finish the game. Gurman, as another hunter, can be parried all the time. Poor guy can't catch a break. And this makes phase 1 essentially a battle of waiting for any attacks you can parry and dodging the fastest swipes and gunshots. Now those gunshots are a massive problem. <laughs> I'm actually not sure how to dodge them 100%, but maybe spamming dodges to your right is enough to not get shredded. Also because Gurman dashes in long distances, he can cover a lot of ground in a flash, so he can corner you constantly. Staying at medium range to bait out the parryable attacks is easier said than done, but not too troublesome. Phase 2 then adds a problem, in that if you are one spam him too much, he will activate hyper armor and eviscerate you right through your attacks. I'm mostly fine attacking just once per parry or whiff, but the problem here is longevity. Gummer has some attacks with massive damage thresholds, and these range from fairly dodgeable to what in the hell is he doing now? This one attack where he hovers above me and does the Inuyasha and Windscar is a complete mystery to me. I have no idea what is happening here or how to dodge it, and it's basically a legit one shot. Dodging into him doesn't work, running away doesn't work, I'm pretty sure blocking doesn't work either. If anyone's got some tips, I ain't refusing. That said, Gummer doesn't have that much health that his fight lasts too long either, so if you just play very carefully, your progress is quite consistent. This is a fight I kinda wanna try again to be honest. I think there might be a way to no hit Gurman that I haven't figured yet, and of course the encounter is dripping with style and lore, so I have no reason to dislike it. And naturally, I made sure to collect the umbilical cords to fight the moon presence, which is a simple boss, sadly. The boss's biggest issue is the amount of visual references, i.e. there's a lot of tentacles sweeping around, so being able to tell which ones are attacking and which ones are idle can make things confusing at first. But once you consider the boss is using similar patterns to a regular beast, it all becomes much clearer. Simply differentiate between the tail tentacles, head tentacles and its actual arms and you're gonna be able to predict everything this thing does. But it's not like any of that matters since the boss has so little health and tactical options that even my BL4 character can play extremely aggressive and sloppy and still beat it in less than 10 minutes of attempts, which was paltry after Lawrence. It actually surprises me that a boss that's meant to possess forces far above my comprehension still has to take the time to turn around and physically see me before attacking. And even when it gets visual contact, the amount of times it overshoots by miles is unreal. Its tracking is seriously poor. Obviously that attack where it drains all but 1 HP from you is a joke, when it stays still for so long that you can get it all back in a few hits. An actual issue is those blood bubbles, which disable your healing if their drip hits you. 
that can actually force you to play more defensively to avoid constant flailing. But still, it's nothing more than a slightly harder victory lap, and I feel it's not deserving of such an influential entity. Gurman was a lot harder and he's meant to be this thing's bitch. What the hell from? And that boss might be a 4 experience. It was quite the enlightening process, and I enjoyed it a whole bunch. And learning the specific skill set for each boss was a huge blast. And once again, I'm trash at these games, so I'm sure anyone else can do this. So that'll be it for me, I'll see you guys next time.